This is episode three of the Immunology Podcast, Platelets in the Immune System with Dr. Bernardo Franklin. Hey everyone, this is Dr. Jason Goldsmith and Dr. Brenda Roud. Welcome back to the Immunology Podcast, where we have cytokine stimulating conversations with immunologists. The Immunology Podcast is brought to you by Stem Cell Technologies, a global biotechnology company supporting life science research and fostering communication and collaboration in science. Today, we have Dr. Bernardo Franklin from the Institute of Nate Immunity at the University of Bonn on the podcast. He's here to talk about his research on blood platelets and their effects on innate immunity, systemic inflammation, and cancer. We've also got our usual roundup of recent highlights in immunology news coming up. But first... And show reliable results with your immunology research from primary human cells to cell isolation kits, culture media, supplements, and antibodies, Stem Cell Technologies provides the tools you need for every step of your immunology research. Interested in cell isolation? Use EasySep to isolate highly purified immune cells from virtually any sample source in as little as eight minutes. Cells are viable, functional, and immediately ready for your downstream applications. Learn more at ecsep.com. Oh, hey, Brenda. How are you? Doing great. How about you? Oh, pretty good. Pretty good. It's starting to warm up here a little bit, finally. It's a beautiful sunny day in Amsterdam today. Excellent. It's uh, time to dive back into the literature. Another week, another million papers have been published. Um, at least <laughs> half of them been on COVID. And so, of course, we have a a COVID paper to discuss today. I actually really like this one because it combines all of my favorite things, a little immunofluorescence, a little uh, protein crystallography, a little uh, protein structure function interactions. And I thought it was really interesting. Okay, bring it on. So this paper is titled CD8 T cells, specific for immunodominant SARS-CoV-2 nucleocapsid epitope cross-react with selective seasonal coronaviruses. And this is First author is Katie Lindbergh. Last author, this is the Stephanie Grass Lab. So that's the last author. It was published April 13th in Immunity. And so what I think is really cool about this is they did a bunch of uh, basically structure function protein mapping. And so they found that the nucleocapsid or N protein of COVID, which is one of the peptides in COVID, um, I'm saying COVID-19 when I really mean SARS-CoV-2, but it's just a lot easier to say here. Uh, that induces an immunodominant response specifically in people with HLA-B7. And so they had found this pattern, um, HLB7, LA, people with HLA-B7 seem to be more immunoreactive to coronavirus generally, or to COVID in particular. And they found that this epitope within that N protein was highly conserved across circulating coronavirus, and that this part drove the immune response. So they found a very specific region of the COVID peptide that was responsible for generating the antigenic response in HLA-B27 B7 positive individuals, and that they also found the same epitope with very small structural changes, a single nuclide change, also had cross-reactivity to OC43 and HQ1 beta coronaviruses, and vice versa. So they saw that people exposed to those coronaviruses had some reactivity in peptides, so immune cells from them and unexposed people, they saw reactivity to the N peptide and then people who had been exposed to COVID and developed immunity or immune reactions to it also were responsive to these peptides from those coronaviruses. But interestingly, it was not the case even with a single, um, new, a single um, amino acid mutation for uh, two other coronaviruses, which are alpha coronaviruses, specifically 229E and NL63. Because they then did the structure function work and showed that was due to differences in the peptide conformation that's going on here. And so if I dive in deep here and pull this up, because I will admit I did not memorize the exact peptide, um, but it has to do with the, there's certain prolines and other kind of proteins that will cause a, a conformational change. And so when those are substituted in, those peptides um, make it so that HLB7 response is lost. And so what I thought was really neat about this is there's been kind of this immune heterogeneity that's been seen in COVID. As we all know, some people get really sick, some people don't. They're seeing this heterogeneity in between B7 positive and negative patients from the N-peptide. So this is separate from the spike protein. But this is this other nucleocapsid protein. So they're seeing already heterogeneity there. And then they're seeing that there's cross-reactivity. And so when we think about all these kids who are exposed to lots of coronaviruses, and then they do really well around COVID, maybe it's because they're all bathed in coronaviruses and develop this cross-reactivity. Or similarly, parents of kids who are also exposed to all their germs, could also then maybe develop in some cases cross-reactivity. Again, if you're that B7 
subtype. And so you're starting to see that this heterogeneity that we're seeing clinically is being mapped out at a biochemical level and an immunological level. And I think that's really fascinating because no one's ever really done this type of work before in, in immunology, generally speaking. I don't think we've ever mapped any respiratory viruses, immune responses down to this level of granularity this fast. And so it's kind of, it's kind of interesting to see this happen for the first time. And I wonder what it's going to start answering um, later for us. So yeah, so, so cool. I, yeah, I thought it was really neat. I thought it was, it's a relatively short paper, but also uh, they did a ton of work. So I had to crystallize the proteins. So could you imagine, and it's a supplementary figure. So Brenda, could you imagine that one of your papers had a supplemental figure that was an x-ray crystal, uh, x-ray crystallography structure, you know, just, just a supplemental figure, like five a or whatever it was. I think it's S six, <laughs> excuse me in this one. Well, but nowadays there's so many papers, like sometimes I also, I find myself looking at the supplements and thinking this, like this one figure could be a paper, especially I think as time goes on, papers are more and more complex. Um, kind of daunting when you have to make papers yourself, feeling like there's so much information in some of these publications that it's just mind blowing. Yeah, I, I find it pretty intense that that's what's going on here. I wonder, Jason, if they, so the end uh, protein would be the nucleocapsid, I assume, inside that is, uh, that is bound to the RNA inside the virus, right? Is it, is it that this end protein is more conserved between different coronaviruses? I assume maybe the spike protein has more more differences and then will be less likely to have cross uh, reactivity between coronaviruses. Is that the case for the end protein? There's some level of conservation to it, but it's not hugely conserved. Uh, but this region is very conserved. And so they're mm. finding, you know, I think they, I'd have to pull up them there. They, they shared. Um, so for instance, SARS-CoV-1 and CoV-2 are 90.3% identical at the end protein. Mm -hmm but are only 29% identical with other end proteins. But this end terminal domain is highly conserved. Right. Um, that makes sense. So, so they they found that it was different. Well, actually they found that the ones that lost the function was when a lysine was then put adjacent to the proline. And so that caused a structural confirmation that, that kicked it out of the pocket and wouldn't let it bind. So they actually did map the, the map, the HLA protein or the, that, that specific HLA that's specific to this, peptide sequence at the end and then showed and then overlaid that peptide and then the other peptides from both ones that it would cross react with and ones that wouldn't show the conformational flip. Um, right. But yeah, so apparently, and, and that's kind of the interesting part is that the whole thing is not that homologous, but that this one region is highly conserved. And even you're talking single, you know, single um, amino acid flips between other proteins, it, even ones that don't cross react with, it can only be a single amino acid off. Well, but that's all you need. You just need one small peptide that can be uh, loaded into an HLA molecule. And of course, changes in that that small uh, sequence will affect the, the capacity of this HLA molecule to bind to this peptide and present them pr uh, yeah. properly. That's very interesting to see different peptides bind and have preference for different types of HLA alleles and how that impacts the, you know, the cellular response, the cellular immune response against antigens, not only COVID, but also uh, cancer that's also very studied, very much studied in, in, in cancer antigens. Yeah. But let's not go to cancer. Let's just stick to COVID because I will double down your paper with another COVID paper, also very recently published, still in press, very fresh. And this paper, you're going to ha be happy to know, comes from University of Pennsylvania, from the lab of John Wary, has three for four uh, shared uh, first author. Rishi Goel, Socrates Apostolidis, Mark Painter, and David Matthew. And they uh, studied the humoral response against COVID, uh, against SARS-CoV-2 in a, around the vaccination of patients with uh, the mRNA vaccines. So uh, the paper is uh, titled Distinct Antibody and Memory B-Cell Responses in SARS-CoV-2 naive and recovered individuals following mRNA vaccination, basically what I said before. And um, in, this, in this publication, this study, they took 44 individuals and they followed the, their, their uh, humoral immune response before, or their, 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 their B cell uh, memory cells and their antibody titers 
right before the uh, vaccination, the first dose of their mRNA vaccination, so this Moderna or BioNTech Pfizer vaccine, two weeks after the first dose, then right before the second dose, and then one week after the second dose. And what is was very interesting is that they had two cohorts of people. One of them uh, were people that had, were vaccinated, were exposed to these antigens for the first time, so where people were healthy and had not contracted uh, COVID. And then they had some of the patients that had actually recovered from a previous uh, COVID infection and were getting the vaccination after the fact. And so what they do is they looked uh, and they compare their responses between these two groups. And I think the results are super interesting and very relevant, particularly for people looking at kind of health policies and how to distribute vaccines, because I don't want to give up the, the, the conclusions right now. But they noticed that, of course, uh, patients that had already been infected with COVID, they had in their, in their, when they took the blood and when they analyzed the, the B cell populations and the antibody titers, they saw that this patient had both of them present and detectable. And this was on, on, for all cases. And that was not the case, of course, for naive patients. Uh, and after the first dose, uh, they could see that naive patients, ex- re- kind of, uh, they did uh, mount a response, but it was not, ex- was not very, very high. The titers of the antibodies were not, were not very high. Whether they were not neutralizing for all the cases. Um, and only after the second dose, they could see a much more robust immune response, uh, in the, in the, in the form of antibodies and neutralizing titers of their, of their serum, uh, against, uh, pseudotyped, uh, VSV, uh, uh virus. And no, that that has the the, the spike protein, um, and then they could see that this really really improved after the boost after the second dose, and that they could even they could also sh- also showed that they uh, the the serum of this patient was also neutralizing against the kind of the the initial uh, SARS-CoV-2 um, strain that it was circulating last year. But also, and very importantly, they also mo- all, almost all the patients had neutralizing antibody titers against the B1351 strain, also known as the South African strain, that has uh, a couple of, of changes that have been associated with the capacity of evading the immune, the a previous immune response. And these mutations were also observed in some of the dangerous new strains in South America, the P1 that was uh, identified in Brazil. So it's very nice to see that two two doses of the mRNA vaccine seem to really provide also protection against this new strain. But I think what was the most interesting was what happened to the patients that had had recovered from COVID-19. And they saw that these patients could achieve the same antibody titers and the same uh, neutralizing um, capacity after the first doses of the of the um, COVID or the mRNA vaccine, which suggests that because of their previous exposure, they already have a memory response that is that is strong enough to just really with the first vaccine you boost it to a maximum level because a second dose did not really did not really improve any longer any more any further the the antibody titers, the presence of memory B cells. And the neutralizing antibodies in their in their serum. So I think this is really cool because it gives the idea that probably if you already had COVID, you're almost fully protected, at least when measuring humoral uh, immunity against uh, the the virus, which is very, is, I think is is a very uh, maybe not for much for the U.S. where there's so many there's so many vaccines already and so many vaccinated people, but for other countries where there is still a, a um, vaccine shortage. Maybe you can be a little bit more confident in one vaccination might help people that were already uh, infected with COVID. Well, that's super interesting. Um, it kind of a couple of thoughts. One, so clinically we see this. So, you know, people get their first vaccine, their arm hurts, their second dose, then they kind of feel like crud for a day. 
And I know people who have had COVID who feel like crud after the first dose. So it kind of suggests that that's, that's replicating itself in, in the wild, as it were. And then second thought is just that John Weary is awesome. Uh, they, you know, I was around at Penn when they were trying to recruit for this, but I got uh, washed out from being able to be a donor for the blood because I have a history of ulcerative colitis. So I have a chronic condition that wouldn't let me donate. But otherwise, you know, I would have been signing up for this. And their lab does a lot of really awesome work. Uh, kind of a, a dream. Hopefully we can get them on here sometime. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I've been following a little bit their research and they, they threw themselves into COVID research like really early on. And they had already very early on really nice data uh, characterizing the immune response in, in COVID patients. So it's only natural that now they're looking at, at the vaccination and how that uh, can educate the, the immune, immune compartment. Of course, in this case, I just want to say that we also know that T-cell immunity is very important for COVID, and they didn't look at it in this paper. But I think that given that most of the measures that are easy to make or are more, uh, more widely spread are B-cell immunology, uh, B-cell immunity, it's really va valuable to have this information. Yeah, no, I agree. And I think that they're starting to address the mutations is, is a key point here, too. All right. Yeah. So I guess next Overlying. up, we're going we're gonna to move on from COVID. We can't all be COVID all day, every day, um, even though it's like, you know, a tour de force of immunology right now. So shout out to all the immunologists in the world. Anyway, so we're going to move on and go back to uh, something that seems to keep coming up. I like I like episodes and content with a theme, a little longitudinal story here, which is Delta Gamma T cells. Or Gamma Again. Delta. Again, always, always Gamma Delta T cells. So this one is called Epigenetic Modulation of Immune Synaptic Cytoskeletal Networks Potentiates Gamma Delta T-Cell Mediated Cytotoxicity in Lung Cancer. It's in Nature Communications, published uh, 12th of April. Uh, first author is Ray Huang Wang, and last author is He Sing Chen Tsai. And this paper is pretty interesting. It kind of, it kind of really, to me, speaks to the complexity of, of immunotherapy and cancer generally. And so to kind of break this into two parts, there are a specific type of drugs known as DNA methyl transferase inhibitors or DNMTs, which basically effectively alter the epige epigenome by altering the methylation of your genome. And so they had not worked particularly well in some cancers. They had some benefits, but weren't super haven't, haven't kind of lived up to what people wanted them to. Similarly, there's been an interest in looking at uh, gamma delta T cells um, because they bridge innate and adapt new systems and can attack cancer cells in an MHC unrestricted way. So that's kind of neat, but they've had very limited success when they've done adoptive transfer in solid tumors of these uh, gamma delta T cells. And there's a couple reasons for this. One, they have trouble expanding the right population because there's multiple populations of gamma delta T cells, just like there's multiple populations of every immune cell until you get down to one immune cell, pretty much. And then, uh, and so part of this is they figured out how to expand a specific subset called the V delta one enriched gamma delta T cells. Um, and so they have a little bit of technology in here for that, which is neat. It just is uses some cytokines ex vivo to expand them. But then they found that it's really the synergy of these two that enable the gamma delta T cells to work in lung cancer. And so what they found was, is that by giving a DNA methyltransferase inhibitor that upregulates surface molecules on the cancer cells like ICAM, that then can induce uh, gamma delta T cell activation. And so if you treat the patient, or in this case, the mouse or cells, from human cancer with the DNA methyltransferase inhibitors, the DNMTs, it's a mouthful. Uh, then you hit them with the gamma delta T cells, you get a much better synergistic action. And so they go through this in impressive detail, stepwise all the way through. Um, they, they start out with this incredibly interesting experiment where they basically um, dope in to the control cells um, heavy label. So by doing that, they can mark all of the proteins from a control cell 
and then compare that to a parallel plate that hasn't been heavy labeled that gets the drug, the DNA methyltransferase inhibitor. And then they let these cells live. They, they stain the surface proteins by a biotin reagent. So the sulfa auto NHS SS biotin bridge. And then they lyse everything and do a total protein extraction. They isolate surface proteins by biotin, you know, agros beads, so Abidin system. And then they prepare it by page and then they do MAP mass spec. And so what they're able to do is they're able to compare the surface protein profile because of that heavy doping between the treated and the untreated. I thought that was really sophisticated and quite neat to see that going on. And then they can look at what proteins and do protein mapping and pathway analysis. And so they do all that and say, hey, look, oh, gamma delta. So, so surface proteins that are known to activate gamma delta T cells are upregulated and they just chase this down for the rest of the paper and really do a great job. They look at, um, they, they develop an expansion system, as I mentioned, they do some single cell RNA-seq to show populations are being shifted with expansion and concentrating it into a very specific subtype. They, they you know, measure their cytokines, and then they do all the right things, showing this really requires for this killing of the cancer, really requires cell-cell adhesion, it's not cytokine release, it's not migration differences, it's all about the cells the cancer cells have been primed to activate the gamma delta T cells and then will allow the gamma delta C cells to kill them. And so it's really neat to combine this epigenetic notion. Uh, they relate the, that epigenetic changes to changes in the cytoskeleton network. So the genes that regulate what type of cytoskeleton you have, it's kind of an actin up microtubule down state. They see it's predictive in patients of outcomes. So patients that have that more prone to be killed by gamma delta T cell immune profile to begin with, or pro, I guess tumor profile to begin with, do better, just like the cells, the immune cells can kill it in vitro. They do it in mice, they do it in cells, lines, they kind of do it every which way. They look at the adhesion, and, and then they look at the ICAM interface between cell-cell interfaces by IF. So they do all the good things. It's, a, it's an impressive paper, quite the tour de force, and I thought it was really neat and really kind of answered Kind of, kind of demonstrated that for this next level of immunotherapy, especially for as we've been kind of talking with some people already, that for these solid tumor treatment, you're really going to have to figure out a way to get the immune cells to work better. And this, and this is one of the ways it looks like it can do that is with with this combo therapy. And so I think it's it's really neat to see kind of this next step happening. There you go. Very nice. That sounds like a lot of work these guys did. Um, so just. For for me to just recap a little bit, so because why by treating with these inhibitors, these methyltransferase inhibitors, you basically reduce methylation of histones, and therefore you become more regions of the DNA become accessible for for expression. Is that the the, the logic behind the the inhibitors in this particular case? Yeah, and then like certain ones are more open because generally speaking, they're going to be more open, and so it kind of primes it to be in the right state. Are these markers that are rec are they recognized by the TCR, the this gamma delta receptor specifically? Are they molecules that are not present in healthy tissue or are just present at higher uh, levels and that kind of triggers the the gamma delta T? So cells? it seems to shift it to be higher levels and more ready to go. Right. If that makes sense. So it's kind of been primed and ready for action, whereas before it was failing. Um, so it shifts it to that that high actin state, more ICAM, more other more markers, other markers, and so then it kind of keeps it there, kind of locks it in to be exposed, as it were. So it's almost like it turns off the cancer's ability to go into stealth mode and downregulate things so that it can't get killed. Right, and then these V these V delta one uh, cells are particularly sensitive to to this molecule. Right, and, they're the, and they're, the, they're the workhorse. They're already known to be kind of the workhorse killer sub-subtype of gamma delta T cells. Nice. Okay, yeah, I think that is a lot to, it's very important to evaluate this combination of treatments because often they, they really synergize in ways that maybe you wouldn't have um, predicted initially. There's a lot of work, as you said, trying to see combinations of therapies and that they can, um, yeah, amplify each other. Yeah, no, it's a whole, new, it's a whole even bigger frontier. You know, none of us will be out of a job for a long time, given how much, uh, how much work there is to do to start even, you know, 
one one drug alone is hard, and then validating a combination gets even harder, right? That's what I think. The logistics are a nightmare. All yeah. right. So then for our last but not least uh, paper for the day, I want to talk about also kind of a therapeutic potential of a new therapy. And this is a paper that also comes from uh, Chinese researchers. So this uh, paper was published that I'm going to talk about was published in Nature Neuroscience. And it was authored by Qi Peng Xu and Hao Chang. Um, from the uh, for last authors are Min Shun Qi and Si Kai Chao from Nanjing and Shanghai in China. And it is a very interesting paper that dives into a topic which I find a little bit strange, uh, but very uh, promising, which is neuroimmunology and kind of inflammation in the brain. I think that we are, especially lately, there's a lot of research done and there's correlations between inflammation in the brain and actually like behavioral and psychiatric disorders. And I think that is pretty fascinating. So in this paper, the the study revolves around a phenomena known as maternal immune activation, in which inflammation uh, occurred during pregnancy can result in behavioral change or behavioral abnormalities in the offspring. And in humans, there is some epidemiological evidence that suggests that that the infection with certain diseases such as rubella, herpes, uh, CMV, and other pathogens can result in an immune activation in pregnant mothers, and that actually then affect uh, behavioral and psychiatric um, characteristics of, of their children. And this has been also very much characterized in the case of, of mice and of uh, animal uh, models in which uh, inflammation induced by, for example, poly-IC or uh, LPS injections in pregnant uh, mice results in an offspring that have, again, uh, kind of symptoms that can be related to autism and social impaired uh, behaviors. Um, so, and this this uh, has been related to an imbalance of inflammatory cytokines in the brain of the of the offspring of this uh, of these pups, and the overactivation of the microglia, which are these kind of resident macrophages that live in the brain and are part of the immune system in the brain. So there's basically two things this this authors um, show in their publication. On the one hand, they establish a different way of inducing this uh, maternal immune activation in mice using uh, antigens from Toxoplasma gondii, which is very they're very highly immunogenic of the of the kind of the parasite stage of uh, of the Toxoplasma, and they um, they basically inject pregnant mice with with this antigen, and they really uh, result in a highly inflammatory response. And that uh, shows uh, both in the mother as in the pregnant mother, and then the offspring. When you measure the pups, uh, several so after two weeks or eight to twelve weeks after birth, you can see that. So here they do a lot of um, kind of un unknown to me before behavioral uh, assays in which they evaluate the mice and their capacity to respond to so they to respond to their peers and how are their social skills with the, as mice and they they for example evaluate uh, when a pup how a pup responds to its mother how a pup uh, then or, or an adult mouse how much anxiety it exhibits by, for example, exposing itself in open spaces. Mice that are more anxious will stick to kind of more protected areas. They will not go to open uh, arenas or open uh, areas in the in the in their kind of experimental uh, cages, and they will be less curious about other mice 
and they will spend more time in kind of isolated behaviors. They will spend more time self-grooming or they will borrow, they will you really have different behaviors that it can be measured. And apparently these are very standard measures when it comes to neuroscience and behavioral uh, sciences. But this, this mice don't have a, co- a cognition, an alteration in their cognitive skills, but just mostly a social, a social and um, behavioral uh, difference uh, after. So the mice that were come from mothers that had been treated with this inflammation that had been uh, injected with these STAs, with this this um, antigens from, from toxoplasma. And so that was a little bit kind of strange for me, but when they also look at the immunology uh, of these mice and the, the immune compartments in the offspring that was exposed to this inflammation in, uh, in the womb, they also looked that these mice have a more inflammatory phenotype, both in, their, in the, the cells in their spleen, they have a higher production of interferon gamma, of uh, IL-17, and they have a lower kind of proportion of um, Th2 type of cells. And more importantly for me, they have an increased uh, expression of IL-6 in their brains, which uh, shows a more inflammatory environment in their brains. Very interestingly, they show that this IL-6 doesn't seem to be produced by the microglia, uh, microglia, which usually is, uh, as, as they are kind of this uh, macrophage uh, population, they seem to actually be produced by the astrocytes, which are non-immune cells that are part of the physical structure of the brain, are also these support cells in, in, the, in the brain structure. And they seem to be producing IL-6 at increased levels in the mice, in this treated mice. and. So, and this brings me to the second part of the paper, which I think was also very interesting, is that they test whether by transferring T-Rex, regulatory T-cells, to adult mice, they can revert this inflammation and they want to see what happens to the behavioral effects that they see in the mice. And long story short, they take mice uh, after eight weeks uh, that have, so that have this this behavioral abnormalities, and by transferring regulatory T cells from mo- from mothers, uh, from pregnant mice into uh, offspring mice, they show that they can reduce both the inflammatory uh, environment in the brain, and they can reduce uh, the behavioral changes that they see in this mice. Kind of, they can treat this uh, MIA by transferring regulatory T cells. And they also study of the very close to the regulatory T cells. They show that they're very activated cells. So they come after mostly from the best ones they find are the ones that are obtained from mothers that were injected with this antigen that have this inflammatory response going on. And if they, if they extract the regulatory T cells from this, from this mice, they seem to be primed to uh, respond to this inflammation, and they seem they seem to be able to pass the blood brain bar- barrier and really go to the site of inflammation. They are they're being directed there by cytokine receptors. They express CCR4, and there's a lot of CCL22 in the brain, which is directing these cells uh, over there. So I think that in general, uh, it's it's very interesting. Again, another way of looking at inflammation in the brain and how this you not know, relates to in the, the experience of, of, of the fetus in the womb and what are the, the, the limits of uh, T-Rex treatment. This seems to be very, uh, very interesting that they can actually revert an established syndrome in adult mice of eight weeks old. Um, that, that's super interesting. Uh, I have a couple thoughts. One, pregnant women change litter boxes, which have a lot of toxoplasmosis in them. And two, uh, this is a public service announcement now. Please do not interpret a mouse experiment as meaning something that you need to do clinically. Anyone who is listening to this, um, please don't throw out your cats because you're pregnant right now. Um, so, so I think this is super interesting. It shows there's a lot going on. It's also, I think, you know, a sign that things are really complicated. But also, I don't want people running around and getting scared about, uh, you know, transient inflammation and what it's doing to their, their you know, unborn child in 
in utero because I think people get really worried about that because everyone gets really worried when they're pregnant. But but these experiments are designed to elicit a response, un unlike you know normal physiology where things tend to work out pretty well. Yeah. Right. I mean, they're injecting highly immunogenic proteins, or in other um, types, they're injecting uh, lipopolysaccharides. We are extremely inflammatory. Uh, so those are very extreme treatments that they do to these mice, uh, and often they even uh, result in a. Um, they actually many of the mice don't kind of don't finish the treatment, so you need to be very. They don't finish the pregnancy; they abort because of this inflammation. So it's very, um, yeah, it's probably not very common among human patients, among human subjects. Yeah, no, I'd agree. Well. So it's been another awesome roundup, and we're about to go be speaking with Dr. Bernardo Franklin at the University of Bonn in just a moment. But before we get to that, looking for in-depth information on cell separation? Download the Cell Separation eBook from Stem Cell Technologies now, a practical guide on everything you need to know about cell isolation techniques, including a collection of protocols. Visit stemcell.com slash cell hyphen separation to explore the guide and download the free eBook. Today, we're joined by Dr. Bernardo Franklin, who is a professor at the Institute of Innate Immunity at the University of Bonn. The Franklin Lab studies the role of innate immunity in steroid inflammation and infectious diseases. Their research has contributed to identifying main triggers of inflammation in malaria, as well as novel extracellular functions of inflammasomes. And more recently, they have been focusing on blood platelets and their effects on innate immunity, systemic inflammation, and cancer. Professor Franklin, welcome. It's great to have you here. Pleasure to be here. So, last year, first authors Verena Rules and Lucas Rivera from your lab published in Cell Reports a article titled Platelets Fuel the Inflammasome Activation of Innate Immune Cells, in which they described how platelets can influence the activity of the inflammasome in macrophages and neutrophils and stimulate the production in vivo of pro-inflammatory cytokine YL-1 beta. So platelets are probably not the first thing that comes to mind associated with the immune system. So perhaps you can introduce our audience to what platelets are, in which ways they can interact with immune cells, and what motivated you to study them in the first place, and maybe elaborate on what you found in this study. Hey, thanks. That's a great question. <laughs> Uh, so ba basically platelets are like little non-nucleated cells. Uh, they are derived from megakaryocytes in the bone marrow and as most recently, recently shown uh, in the lungs as well. So the lungs also produce maybe 50% of the platelets in at least in mouse that was shown. Uh, so these platelets, they are very well known for their let's say almost static works, uh, meaning that they are involved in coagulation, right? They these blood clots, uh, and they are also associated with problems like um, heart diseases and etc. cetera. But uh, they are actually the second most abundant cells in your blood. Uh, so they, over, or they outnumber leukocytes like neutrophils and macrophages by at least a hundredfold in a healthy adult. But they still, they were never really regard as having immune functions. I'm not saying we're the first ones to show, but this is indeed a field that is starting to, to be considered, right? Like that platelets have more functions than just coagulation. Uh, and indeed, I, very soon I started to work with them. I learned how, why, it was, why the reason is that. It's also because it's very annoying and difficult to work with this. <laughs> May I call them little bastards? <laughs> it's basically one, this cell type that even when drawing blood, there is a special way to draw the blood. So you don't put so much pressure in the syringe or, or in the, you know, the, the, what you use to draw. So they don't clot. Um, but anyway, what led me to think about them, uh, it was first that they are super numerous in, in terms compared to other cells. And then I was actually looking for, it's like coming from the inflammasome field that where 90% of the studies are done in macrophages, like first in mono, mono culture of cells, right? Everybody choose this one cell isolated from the, the tissue or the blood to work with it. 
not to mention that most of the studies are on macrophages. So it's nice that we learn a lot about inflammasomes on macrophages, because when you have this one cell, you can just knock in stuff, knock out stuff, and find out how the signaling pathways operate. But I always have this thing, this, this, this thinking that by doing this, you completely ignore the cell-to-cell -cell interactions that happens in the tissue. And what I'm saying about lasers could apply very well for stroma cells or anything else. And I, this always annoyed me that uh, if, if you would, just to make a parallel, if you would always study the T cell in isolation, you would never discover, for example, antigen presentation that, that includes the dendritic cells and, and, and T cells, right? So this was led me to look into platelets in the context of inflammation. And because my field of recent research is inflammasome, uh, that was a reasonable question at the time that I thought I should pursue. Yeah, that's a really good point that you make, which makes me think of the implications for in vitro studies that are looking into the activation of inflammasome in these types of cells, which presumably are done with cultures that don't have platelets or have been removed uh, and how does that compare to the situation in vivo where you have plenty of platelets in the bloodstream and thus do you think this absence affects the relevance of these results and do you think people should start adding platelets to their cultures to keep up? Yes, uh, that's entirely correct and I, I have to confess a great part of it we found by accident. And that is because working with neutrophils, for example, every, everyone that works with neutrophils uh, knows that uh, there is not really a surrogate cell line that you could use to replace your neutrophils. So you always need them fresh from the bone marrow or from the blood. And what we found is that by using not only stem cell isolation magnetic kit, kits, but also the mutant ones, that uh, the neutrophils and as well as the monocytes, so there is two different kits, right? Uh, one one of them is even funny because it's called it was called a uh, neutrophil isolation kit, and there there was a catalog number for it. But if you now search for the same kit, they change the name to enrichment kit because uh, they cannot guarantee purity, at least if they consider the platelets. So the neutrophils that were coming after the isolation with the platelets. So at the time, stem cell was developing this uh, platelet removal component, which is mainly antibodies and PBS that you can add to the mix and then get rid of more platelets. You still do not get rid of all of them, but you remove a lot of them. So what we started to do was to compare the cells that we isolate with what we call the standard method uh, and the cells that we isolated removing platelets, like platelet depleted cells. And we saw significantly difference in transcriptomics uh, in functional and cytokine production in these cells. The important thing was when you add the platelets back, you restore this, this activity of these immune cells. So a lot of this, this, uh, this effect is, is just a transient thing. So the cells are not dying, they're still viable, they just need the platelets to accomplish their full function. And people actually do this kind of experiment, not the depletion one at least, but adding platelets to to cultures of cells. Um, but one thing that is always missing in literature is the uh, typical control that they use the, uh, when you use the platelets alone. It's basically, if you think, you, you study in two cells, right? Two cell types, cell A and cell B. So most of the papers they do, the studies they do cell A, cell A plus B, and that's it. There is no like cell B alone. So the effect of platelets themselves on this co-culture was not really shown. And when we tried that, we saw that there is not much that they do, at least in the terms of inflammasome activation. Everything, all the effect that we saw is mediated by platelets into other cells, but the platelets themselves don't do much in terms of I1 production. And this was a very long year of frustration for my PhD student because we based on studies that would say, yes, they do have inflammasomes and yes, they do I produce I1 and we could not reproduce any of this data to the point that uh, I, I offer one of the big guys in the field to send my student to the, this lab. I, I, I emailed him and said, look, I cannot reproduce your data. 
we have a problem. Would you mind if I send my student there? She learns because there's something we might be doing wrong. And he told us, oh, actually we don't do this anymore. Like we haven't done for some several years. Uh, but always we detect this, this proteins in platelets in the, at the mRNA level by qPCR, which we also did. We, you do detect it, but after the cycle 40, which is when you also detect anything else. <laughs> so, gotcha. Uh, when we basically, my student was about to give up, and she's after like six experiments in a row, taking blood from donors with all kinds of disease to, to, to investigate what the platelets were producing, and they would not produce these cytokines. She told me one day, oh, look, if you ask me to go in the lab and look for IO1 in platelets, I seriously give up. That's it, you know? And then I told her, okay, let's forget what we read and let's pretend we are the first ones to show. So we went back to mRNA levels to, we even looked into the megacaricides and they don't have inflammasomes. So there is no way the platelets will have. But only this thing alone took us one year of this project. And so all negative data is not something you have, like, ah, you know, you publish with <laughs> all your heart. No one wants, no one's cared. No one cares about it. We publish anyway, of course, I think it deserves. But a lot of this project started with accidents, with things not working, with things not going the way we expected until we actually found, well, at least let us do something to other cells. So let's study that. It sounds like you at least have a happy accident, though, that like all the kits people were using for neutrophils or whatever other immune isolation had enough platelet contamination that the fact that we think a monocyte or a neutrophil does this, even if platelets were required, there were probably enough there to get that signal to be accurate. So would you say that's that's pretty true up to this point that we haven't been like the current body of literature has had accidental platelets on board in a lot of cases, which probably is good from a understanding what the cells do perspective, even if it's really a biculture system versus a monoculture. Absolutely. And as I said, this, this is the same for not just platelets, right? For stroma cells, the core message that we are learning maybe by the hard way is that we take cells from the environment, from the tissue, from the blood, you can do a lot with them, but you should not speculate that they will do the same in vivo, where they are surrounded by other cells, where they are soluble factors floating around that makes you know the, the levels of regulation. And regarding your question about the neutrophils and or monocytes, it's definitely true that uh, and luckily a lot of the literature is shifting towards this this observation, like. There are studies from the Pope Cubes lab in Canada already showing, and also Andreas Hidalgo showing the dependence of these cells to basic functions like neutrophils alone. It was shown that they cannot migrate without the platelets, that they do, do not produce nets uh, without the platelets, that they, they at least they have a difficulty in producing nets. Um, and also even the neutrophil survival, like everyone that works with neutrophils knows that you have like a four to six hours time to work with these cells and then they start dying, right? Mm -hmm. If you add platelets to these neutrophils, you, they, you can expand their lifetime for 24 to 48 hours. And that was already published, not even my data. Um, I can send you all the, the references after this show if you would like to, <laughs> to have it. Um, so yes, we learned actually from everything that was not working and luckily, uh, we could actually have a solution for the for monocyte thing because we use this platelet depletion, uh, component that is cell apart from the kids. And from there we are, we are actually, it's the next story that is coming up is on monocytes. It's really like, it's, it's not just about inflammasomes anymore. They just don't behave when you take the platelets out. And one of the experiments we actually did is that when you compare fresh blood that you take from a donor to a, a, a blood that is sitting in a, like in a, from we got from the blood bank, right? In these little bags. So for the blood bank, they take a lot of the platelets out to start. And they're, the places that are there, they're not, they don't really survive too long. So when you just compare the basal activity of these monocytes, uh, the ones from the bu Buffy coat and the ones fresh, it's already different. You know, the fresh ones are much more potent and potent in a lot of immune response compared to the other ones. And the funny thing is that you can recover the 
the Buffy code and the monocytes and neutrophils from the Buffy code by just adding platelets back to them. So it's really a transient thing that uh, you can play around with. So this piques my interest clinically uh, from the clinical side of my brain because platelets are known as an acute phase reactant. So uh -huh. basically anytime someone's inflamed or sick, has chronic you know, cancer, inflammatory bowel disease, rheumatoid arthritis, often one of the signs is that you know D-dimer and fibrinogen can be elevated in the patients, but so can their platelet count. So you can just have an elevated thrombocytosis, uh, which is a marker of persistent chronic inflammation. And so this, this I, I, I don't know uh, if this, how to stimulate in this more conversation, but just interesting to me and in that we're finding, you're finding that platelets are this driver of inflammatory responses. And yet clinically, we've known at least for a very many years that they go up during inflammation. And so yeah. it's, it's interesting to see that they're actually, that's not just like a marker in the blood, but actually probably functional um, and driving some of the inflammation. So I don't know if you guys have started to look at how inflammation, if there's a feedback loop where obviously you've shown that platelets seem to help promote inflammation, but somehow inflammation is promoting platelet production. Indeed, that was, I mean, back on the early, not the early, like the 70s, when Charles and Ariel was actually discovering IO-1 and, and functions of the cytokines, one of the functions of IO-1 alpha is to signal the bone marrow and induce thrombopoiesis, so secretion of platelets. So it's, you know, in our, in one hand, platelets boost inflammation. In the other hand, inflammation boosts platelet production. So it's really like a, uh, but I have to mention the counter side of that. So for example, in, in sepsis, places have a beneficial role because they sequester uh, TNF alpha and IL-6 and remove it from the circulation. So in sepsis where IL-1 plays less of a bigger role compared to these other cytokines, play, uh, adding platelets is actually beneficial. So it's not always they should, you know, take your aspirin and bring your platelets count down. <laughs> count right. down but well, then you get what's called DIC, disseminated intervascular coagulation, um, which yeah. depletes your platelets. And that's one of the worst things that can happen in sepsis is that your mm -hmm. platelets deplete. Uh, you have bruising everywhere in your body. And then uh, the, the the joke acronym for DIC is death is coming uh, because yes. that's a, that's an early sign that the patient with sepsis has progressed to the point that they're going to be hard to survive is actually platelet depletion and thrombocytopenia. Yeah. I mean, depletion in this case is because they have thrombosis. And then, of course, if you measure the circulating platelets in the blood, they will be lower, but it's just because they are stuck somewhere else. It's not yeah. that you actually have a yeah, they've all they've all third like, space. It could yeah. be as well, but uh, in principle, it's more clotting. Yeah, which you would suggest you actually have way more platelets than normal, and that's these accelerate cl clottings as well, which is disseminated DIC, right? Disseminated intravascular coagulation. Yep, and then you get the platelet clotting, but then there's not enough in the blood to soak up the cytokines, and then so you have more third spacing of fluids, and then they can't maintain their blood pressure, and so it just starts that vicious cycle. Yeah, so you, don't, you, you lose you lose the ability of the platelets to to soak up all the cytokines, and then all right. that's bad. Yes. Another interesting result from your publication is the correlation that you found between platelet count and the concentration of IL one beta in the blood of patients with malaria, which seems to suggest that platelets have a role to play in the pathology of this disease. I was wondering if you could comment a little on what can be the influence of platelets in general in inflammatory diseases that are IL-1 driven. Uh, and you have mentioned rheumatoid arthritis and uh, Kawasaki disease. And how can we use, if we can use platelets as markers for these diseases or to better understand their pathology? Um, I could comment on that but it's definitely something we are still learning. So, um, for example, there is different fields where platelets are becoming more prominent as players, uh, starting, for example, with cancer and tumor and immunology. Uh, as uh, Jason has mentioned, high platelet counts are usually associated with poor prognosis in several inflammatory diseases, and of course, cancer is one of them. Uh, but also, there was always this misconception that platelets, uh, they are in the blood. They don't reach the tissue site of infection. And that's also not, doesn't seem to be true because 
uh, not only in cancers, uh, the platelets were being shown to access the core of a tumor, which is usually re refractory to immune cells and acquire antigens from this tumor. And this is actually gave rise to the term educated platelets, like tumor educated platelets. And in a study by Best et al, published in Cell in 2019, I think, or 18, they show that these platelets that are now in the blood but have been into the tumor can relay information about the tumor with 95% accuracy and tell you know what kind of tumor it is and so on. So you can find that study, I think, was a fascinating one. And that kind of kick off this field of educated platelets that other papers follow up. And uh, in a different story, for example, um, by Yong, Wong et al. <laughs> they show that, for example, if you use platelets now to deliver pd one immunotherapy, uh, the platelets, because they specifically interact with cells in areas where there is a wound. So in this case, they basically remove the tumor surgically. So that creates a wound where a clot will uh, usually occur. So platelets drive to that place and they can efficiently deliver the pd one antibodies in that site and not deliver anywhere else, or at least with less um, uncontrolled dissemination of the, their thera therapeutics. So that was two, there were, these were two really cool studies that really brought the platelets as a, almost like a, a second arm that we could explore in tumor immunology, for example. Um, Regarding their roles in, in inflammation, as I said, it's, we're still naive. Like we know they do stuff, uh, they, at least they assist other cells. We don't know yet, as Jason was saying, what comes first. You know, are platelets a consequence of an inflammation or they are actually players in inflammation? I would say because of the studies we do in steady state, like in healthy donors with no overt disease, just taking platelets out already suppress a lot of the activity of immune cells. Uh, I think they are just uh, like cofactors of immunity, at least. So speaking of this cofactor role, I noticed you spent a bunch of time in the paper trying to figure out the culprit. And I have to say, you did an impressive job, and I'm sad you didn't find it. Um, and so I don't know if you have like another paper coming out that you don't want to talk about too much. But if you wanted to talk about that a little bit, you know, you showed sometimes it was cell cell, often it yeah. wasn't, and then you know you showed it was heat activated, so it's probably a protein. And you tested every single thing you probably could get your hands on easily, and it didn't all work. So <laughs> and it's probably calcium dependent through GPCRs, so I don't know, like, I was wondering if you did any of the GPCR downstream stuff like pertussis toxin or any of the decoupling of the GPCRs to drive it, or if you have more, you know, teasers you want to give us on uh, what the heck the platelet factor, mm -hmm. unknown yeah. platelet factor or the Bernardo Franklin factor is yet in platelets that uh, is doing this, because it seems like you, you, you tried to get there and couldn't, and I'm sure it drove you nuts. Yes, now indeed that you raised one key point because everybody I speak to, to about this this odyssey that we went through, including the editor, uh, told us you know this paper would be from the amount of effort we put into it, it would be published higher. But it's just that uh, not that cell reports is any better, of course. But like you know we have a we actually the final version which was published has way less supplemental figures that we have. Uh, for it, we have a whole RNA set that we did on macrophage that received platelets and platelets alone and everything that we did not include in the end because also was just opening more another layer which was metabolism. You know, platelets regulate the metabolism of the cells, and this is deep, definitely not my area. And I mean, I, it was driving us to, a, I mean, okay, we have something that is calcium dependent that is. Uh, heat sensitive is, you know, is not a lipid apparently, but it could be other lipids we didn't really exclude. But in the end, we actually found stuff that kills the platelet effect, but it means it also kills the whole inflammasome effect without the platelets because we have it to inhibit so many targets in one cell that in the end it was just a toxic effect. Mm -hmm. Um, and up to this day, I still, I have to confess, I still don't know. Uh, I, I think it's a synergistic thing. It's not just one thing. And 
in the story as it, the, uh, what led us to this data was of course a bias, an unbiased approach starting with the proteomics which indicated everything we went through. Uh, and then closest we saw that, okay, it, it has a little bit of TLR4 involvement, it has a little bit of, of, of S100 or, uh, and then we, we look for the common receptors, but the common receptors are shared. And when we, we inhibit all these receptors, the platelet effect was gone, but everything else was gone as well. <laughs> and it's too bad I cannot show you, but in the end of my talks, when I talk about this paper, I have this, because of, you know, instead of filling slides with negative data, instead of, oh, it's not this, it's not that, it's not that other, I have one little table with all the factors and approaches we took. And wherever there was a mouse model available, we used, and, and there's a cross. Okay, mouse cross. Uh, when there is no mouse, we use antibody because sometimes it was just a human protein. There is no model for that. Or when there is no antibody available, no mouse available, we use an inhibitor. And when none of those are available, we use an agonist to see, okay, if the agonist alone reproduce the platelet effect. And this table, which occupies the whole slide, is full of axes. And in the end, it was a, just like a, a, <laughs> a tour de force, and we still did not find it, how they do that. Yeah. So and there's even more, sorry. Uh, we found in that paper that for macrophages, it's contact, cell contact independent, right? We did trans well with these inhibitors of phagocytosis. But if you look at the monocytes and neutrophils that are in the blood, then the interaction with the platelets is contact dependent. And that kind of, I mean, I don't want to speculate too much on that, but that makes sense that the macrophages are in the tissue and because platelets don't get there so easily, they found a way to communicate. They release vesicles, they release factors. Whereas the monocytes and neutrophils, they are surrounded by numerous numbers of platelets, each one of them. Then there is a second layer of regulation, which is the contact thing. Uh, so, you know, they are together, but there is secreting stuff doesn't really help in that. Yeah. So I was wondering, you mentioned you mentioned vesicles for the macrophages where there's no contact. I know you did all the supernate and showed it work and couldn't find couldn't find the culprit. Would you ever guys filter out all exosomes and see if it was an exosome process separate from like, you know, so take the supernate and, and pull out all the exosomes and see if it worked or not. So if you at least knew if it was in exosomes or not. I know that's a pain dealing with exosomes is not oh, yeah, fun. It's a pain. We, we, I mean, to be very honest, we did. Uh, but not exactly like that. I really didn't want to get into the, the how you say this, dichotomy of exosomes, ectosomes, where people in the field already fought about, fight with themselves. So a guy coming out of the field and trying to say, so we just stick to the basics. We centrifuge the platelet supernatants at 100,000 K, a G, sorry. Um, and I don't care what I pellet down. You know, it's small stuff, big stuff. I just use the self, the vesicle free soups, if it, you can believe that is vesicle free, I'm not sure, <laughs> and the pellet content, right? I'm not calling these exosomes, ectosomes, or whatever. Size, but basic size split. It's not on the field, what I would do. <laughs> so we did that, and we saw that the effect is still in the soluble fraction, meaning it's not on vesicle, vesicle, vesicle part, I don't know, pellet. But with 100,000 G, I'm not sure if you actually pellet vesicles or if, in principle, you do, but they could also break up because of this, the force, right? This integration force. So this is the basic experiment we did. Uh, and for me to go beyond that, I would definitely pair with a, a specialist on the field and just outsource. Okay, here's the platelet soups as much as you want. If you can narrow that for me without getting into trouble, you go for it. <laughs> Fair enough. It was a really great effort that you did, which derived in a great publication, and we congratulate you for it. And wish you good luck in your upcoming publication. Just keep us posted. We are looking forward to see where this takes you. And in the meanwhile, I wanted to ask you uh, a question related more to your career. Um, you are originally a researcher from Brazil, where you did your PhD at a rather uh, prestigious foundation, the Osvaldo Cruz Foundation in Rio de Janeiro. 
and which is an institution with 120 years of experience in medical research and has some illustrious alumni, such as uh, Dr. Carlos Chagas, who described for the first time the life cycle of the disease that carries his name. How has your experience been to become a um, professor at a German university? And is there any career advice or uh, advice that you can give to young researchers looking up to you and what you have achieved? Oh, career advice, that's tough. <laughs> I hate those. Because <laughs> they always blame you for that, you know? <laughs> I don't know. No, I, I, I honestly have to say not everything that worked for me can work for everybody, right? There's no recipe. I also had in mind that my background and my trajectory might not reflect, especially talking to other Brazilians, right? I mean, I was privileged to be able to study and not have to work when I was young, you know, like, uh, or I, that I have a structured family and didn't come from, you know, uh, a home that, uh, sorry to say, like the, the father beats the mother or anything, any drug abuse, anything. So I, I actually, I could dedicate to study. I could, uh, you know, my time was just for that. Uh, didn't have to do anything instead. I could Uh, so that already separates me from a lot of people that could have the same chance, right? But I mean, not to mention that, of course, um, I think what I always try to do is remain curious uh, and really try to narrow down things. Uh, and that, this last paper was an example of that. Like I have my student wanted to give up. He said, look, there is... I cannot reproduce this stuff. Let's just change the hypothesis, change the project. Well, I'm happy to do that, but at least with data, right? And until you, the data suggests my hypothesis is not wrong or not right, we go until the end. Um, so, I don't know, I, I work in different fields, like I transition from infectious disease, which is what you do in Brazil mostly, uh, at the time, at least of my studies, now you can do a lot more, but it's because of the, the the theaters of the country, right? We have a lot of infectious disease, so that's where you get more funding to study. So I study, I actually start on Chagas disease, malaria, stosomosis, like stosomiasis, actually. And then when I moved to Germany, I started to deal with disease of the Western societies, right? Like this non communicable disease, like Alzheimer's, uh, type diabetes, chronic inflammation, and so on. But The one thing that remains in all of this is that, you know, is the fundamental question to me, what's driving this, you know? Like even infectious disease, sometimes it's not the bug that's driving the disease. Like malaria has been there. You know, if you go to Africa, you find people with malaria right now and they're still working, doing whatever. If you take one drop of their blood and and, and use it to a naive donor like you and me, we, we are dead in like a couple of weeks. <laughs> and this guy is just there, so it's, Is, I believe it's not the the aim of the parasite to to kill the host. And learning about this, learning what is happening, it's what drove me. And if I mean, if you can take this as, as an advice, I don't think it's a <laughs> it's a much more a cliche. Remain curious and and, and provocative, and don't take bullshit. <laughs> sounds great. Sounds like sounds like good advice. Yeah, I think I think to piggyback on that, there's a lot of people who probably come from a uh, Western Hemisphere background or used to kind of the the American system. I don't know if you could speak more to how how the academic system is a little bit different. You know, coming from South America and then going over into Europe, like how does how does that pathway compare to the standard canonical in the U.S. and at least in Canada to an extent? It's grad school, postdoc, postdoc, postdoc until you're done. Try to get a faculty position. And it's 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 my understanding it's, it's somewhat of a different market, but I think you could speak better to what you've you've encountered having been all over compared to a lot of people who only stay kind of within one institution um, or with one in one country or two, and how 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 it's different in different parts of the world, even between South America and Europe. Okay, at least based on my experience in U.S., I spent some time there and in Germany. 
Uh, one of the major things I felt in Germany is that, uh, in New Europe at least, but Germany as well, because uh, is the opportunity of funding that is uh, like stratified by by uh, uh, I call that sorry that 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 you can apply within your own uh, stage. Meaning, if you just finish a PhD. And if you, or just finish your first postdoc. So there are different schemes like the Emmy Nota from the DFG or even the ERC, which is seven years after your PhD. That means you compete with people that have seven years, just like you, right? So it narrows a lot the your competitors instead of competing with super big guys as like the R R R one from the from US used to be. I don't know if they're still like that, but if I, if I just finish my postdoc and I write my first IR1, I'm competing with 50 whatever years old uh, scientists with really, really well-established careers. And, you know, that's just, you're out. There's no way. So the amount of programs in Europe and in Germany for young scientists was really a, a striking difference already. There is so much. If you look, there is even a... a, a uh, research in Germany website, with, which always announced what is what you could apply for small grants of fifty thousand to mm, like mid grants of thirty to three hundred thousand, so on. So I managed during my postdoc to get small grants like this that would give me this one the first technician, the first person I hired that already is like you know helps you a lot, or at least a little funding to 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 pay your own salary and so on. Right. So this is this one advantage, but the system remains the same, right? And I would say I'm very conscious there is no way I would ever get into a professorship in a German university through the natural route. It would take me forever if, if I would get there, if it wasn't for getting a competitive grant like a ERC that you have the power of negotiating. You, you, you know, now you say, look, if I decide to go, the money comes with me. And this really, that's when I saw everything changing for me in several levels, you know? Um, so it is still the system in most places, right? Uh, it's papers and money, right? <laughs> you have them <laughs> and, and most times one brings the other. Yeah. And it sounds like at least like American systems have some ways for younger people to get grants, but it sounds like there's better or more pathways potentially in Europe. I know nowadays you can get a bump in your score for your first R01 until you get your first one, but it's still, it's a bump in the same pool. There are some early stage career grants, but it's not the same power of negotiation. You, you kind of get in this catch 22 of, I need a, I need a grant to get a job, but I need the job position to be eligible for the grant which seems yes. to be a, a catch the American system still is trying to sort out. So it's interesting to hear that at least in the European universe, there's some, there's some uh, funding tiers that may be addressing that. You still have to have the money, but you can actually apply at every position for more of it. Yes. And also there are different rates of success for, you know, like there is of course our ERC or like R1 that is, I don't know, 10% success rate. But you also find calls and grants here with 40%, 30% success rate. So there is just too much. Also, partnerships with industry and academia that can also fund your research. So if you know where to look for, you always find a program that you could apply. I think we're, we're getting close to wrapping up. We always like to ask our guests a couple of fun questions uh, that's not quite directly related to their research. So. Uh, the first one for you is, what is the best piece of advice you've ever been given, professional or not? This could be something about your golf game, if, if need be. But, but any piece of advice you've been given that's really stuck with you in life? Okay. Because that's quite a tough question. I'll just focus on the professional one because that's one I, I, I can't remember easily. Uh, and it's not really advice I got uh, during my time, but it's something I learned through experience which is especially for young postdocs or students that are finishing their PhD and they're looking for a postdoc, a lab to do their postdoc, right? So what is usually do? You check some big guy's name and, okay, you know, he's published a cell last year, nature the year before and so on. I want to work with him. So one thing I learned is that when, okay, you want to work with someone like that, 
and this is not to say anything bad about anyone, of course, but that, that is a system you could use to really base your decision where to spend the next three, four years of your career, which is actually the ones that really will either launch you to the academic career that you, you desire or actually bury you in one position. So one way I learned to do this is, okay, let's say Jason is a big guy, right, in the field of, I don't know, the field I want to work with. So you're the, the guy that published all the papers that give the keynote speakers, uh, give keynote talks in conference. So I, I go to your website and I see a photo of you with your teammates, right? You have all this stuff. Then I start to look, okay, I found this Brandon that works with you. So I noticed that Brandon works with you for the last six years and etc. So then I check if his publication records match yours. This will tell me that Either you carry Brandon and you promote your own people, or you know Brandon is just a guy that if it succeeds, great. If not, you have another one and so on. So by looking at the combined publication of the lab members, especially the ones that are there for longer, can really teach you a lot about the environment you're going to. Because it could be that you just get there and it's like this environment that you know uh, one wants to kill the other, like, <laughs> and you're like, okay, the ones that publish on nature, they are promoted and this keeps the grants coming, the others can fail, it's not a problem because the labs are still running and everything. So when you see this simply, this simple search on searching approach can really read you from a toxic environment uh, and really, so I didn't have this, I don't, not saying I went through a bad phase, nothing, nothing bad happened, I actually don't never regret coming to work at the Institute of Native Unity with ICA, that was my Postdoctor for supervisor, but it's it's either uh, it's something I saw many other students that pass through the institute end up in a place that they later send us email oh, I'm about to give up and something actually gave up and they're like it's not uh, because they just did like that they went for the big name the big lab full of money full of people without really knowing what to expect. I guess the risk is you fall through the cracks uh, if you're not careful enough. Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's an important decision, right? It's where not only where you're going to spend the next years of your life, sometimes it's actually when people are starting a family. So the work balance uh, is also compromised. Uh, sometimes you are in a different country and now you get there and you have absolutely no support and your, your work environment is just, I don't know, <laughs> not healthy. And then well, you're stuck. You need the job. You're there already, and it's, yeah, it's there. There are ways to at least have an idea if this would be a good or bad move. All right, and then we have one more for you, which is what is the biggest misconception about science that you would like to resolve? Especially this day and age, where you know science is all in the news all the time with lots of misconceptions because of a nasty Absolutely. little virus running around. Yeah, so it's not necessarily a misconception, but the way we phrase it, it, it makes a misconception, is the saying that science corrects itself. It is true, but the correction is way more painful than the first one that published there. <laughs> so to give you this example in this paper from Cell Reports, that we have it to say, okay, that is, as you see, there is a whole bunk of the paper, a whole bunch of it that is just showing no, other people were wrong. We could not detect inflammasomes or I1 and platelets. And this took us almost killed the story because it was even annoying to write that part. You know, it's not what I want to tell. It's not the story I want to tell. But the reviews ask so much of us because they were used to the field saying that is this. They do that. And, and if you check the publications, they say that you would, if you were a reviewer, then you would, you would not, you know, you would not accept it. It's just because they were the first and there was this appealing. But the first evidence that platelets have inflammasome was all done by fax with no controls whatsoever, like isotype controls or anything. They just stained platelets. They saw positive, like positive events, and platelets are full of FC receptor. Anything you try to stain on them, you, you'll find it. So it came to the point that we did all the assays necessary, not only the ones the, the study did, but also all the others, but because the, the study was done in dengue fever, 
one of the reviews even said to us in the end, oh, look, we did, in, we did uh, no pulp mice uh, for IO-1. We did like megacaricides for human and, and mouse. We showed all different types, report the mice for inflammasomes and everything we did. In the end, he said, yeah, but you did not look in dengue. And the study was in dengue, right? So, okay, I'm not going to dengue just to prove that. <laughs> so I thought that the first study when it was published, if we would have all these controls, we would have the same conclusion. So we learned really, that was a frustrating experience for us. My student, this is one of the students that actually left academia. She's not working on industry. She said, this is not for me, you know? Uh, because I mean, we would go to conferences and no one would visit her poster because it's just showing, uh, oh, like we have a big don't in your title. Please don't do that. <laughs> you know, like mm -hmm. instead of something exciting to show, like this, this was really frustrating. So science correct itself, yes, but I mean, we still live with the with the fake through the antioxidants, uh, like you know this. That there was never a publication about there is this publication about in nature like the ten biggest myths in science, and one of them is this antioxidant that we that we use in several several things like makeup, whatever to to make you look younger. This is complete bullshit. It was the first time this was ever mentioned. Was a review that cites another review, but, and that's it. And it sticked. And then up to this day, we still think that antioxidants do something like in, at least in, in in aging or whatever it is. <laughs> I've always said that there should be a, a journal of negative data that and should have the highest impact factor of all the journals because it should be cited more than everyone else. And a yes. good negative data paper uh, is my dream one day uh, to see happen and a negative paper journal that uh, does that. But again, uh, thank you, Bernardo, uh, for coming on today. And it's been a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Nice to meet you. That brings us to the end of our show. Don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter at immunologypodcast.com to get show notes, including an episode summary and links to all of the interview and roundup papers. You can also reach out to us on Twitter at Immunopodcast or via email at info at immunologypodcast.com with feedback or to suggest guests. See you next week. <laughs>